Hi, my name is Polina Kirichenko. I'm a PhD student at New York University. And today we will talk about how we can use generative models for out of distribution or anomaly detection. The plan for this talk is the following. First, I will give a brief introduction into deep generative models. Then we will discuss the challenges which may arise when applying generative models to detecting anomalies. Finally, we will talk about existing methods that address these issues and successfully apply generative models to out of distribution detection. So let's start with the intro to generative modeling. Most machine learning problems are supervised. We want to predict the target values y given features x. Classification, regression, segmentation, and object detection are all examples of supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, the goal is instead to learn the distribution of data, which we define by p star of x. The most standard approach in unsupervised learning is to define a parametric model p theta that defines a likelihood in the data space. For example, on the slide, we have a counter plot of a Gaussian density in two dimensions, which can be parameterized by its mean and covariance matrix. And it is approximating the distribution of these blue crosses data that we observed. We can find the optimal theta by maximum likelihood approach, which is to maximize the total log likelihood of trained data with respect to parameters theta. The Gaussian model from the previous slide is one of the simplest generative models that we could use. While it is easy to work with, it lacks capacity. We can't fit the distribution of amnes digits or natural images with the Gaussian. We can introduce additional flexibility into the model by considering a mixture of Gaussians. However, unless the number of mixture components is very large, the Gaussian mixture models are still very constrained in the type of the data that they can learn. Deep generative models, or DGMs, are models where the data distribution is approximated using a neural network. These models often involve millions of parameters and are very flexible. In the scope of this talk, we are interested in three types of DGMs, autoregressive models, variational autoencoders, and normalizing flows. And now we'll briefly discuss their structure. Autoregressive models define the distribution in the data space through the chain rule. A neural network is used to parameterize the conditional distribution of the coordinate i, given the coordinates 1 through i minus 1 of the input x. With autoregressive models, we can compute the likelihood of a given data point exactly and use maximum likelihood to optimize the parameters of the model. Variational autoencoders, or VAEs, are latent variable models. For each data point x, the encoder predicts a latent variable z, or more precisely, parameters of the distribution of that latent variable. And then the decoder tries to reconstruct the input data from that latent variable. We have to perform variational Bayesian inference to simultaneously infer posterior distribution over z and the distribution of x given z both of which are parameterized by deep neural networks. For VAEs, we can't compute the likelihood of the training data exactly, and instead we maximize a variational lower bound on the likelihood to train the model. Finally, normalizing flows are deep generative models based on invertible neural networks of special architecture. The input data X is modeled as an invertible transformation f of some simple random variable z in the latent space. Usually it is chosen to be a standard Gaussian. Then we can compute likelihood p theta of x exactly for this model using a change of variable formula. It will be the latent likelihood times the determinant of the Jacobian of this transformation. So autoregressive models, VAEs and normalizing flows all have either tractable exact likelihood or an approximation to it. The most common benchmark for deep generative models is the generation of natural images on datasets like MNIST, CIFAR, Celeb A, or ImageNet. All three model classes that we discussed achieve strong performance in image generation. For example, on the slide are the samples from a normalizing flow model, GLOW, trained on Celeb A celebrity faces dataset. 
While generative modeling is an exciting topic in itself, we are interested in the application of DGMs to uncertainty. One of the first ideas to use generative models for anomaly detection was presented in the work of Bishop. He described a simple approach to use generative models in combination with supervised classifiers. First, we choose some threshold for the likelihood epsilon, and the generative model is used to detect whether or not the input data point is in distribution or out of distribution, depending on whether its likelihood falls below or above the threshold. So in other words, we are using one-sided test on likelihood for detecting anomalies. In this framework, if the data is detected as in distribution, it is passed to the classifier to make predictions as usual, but the model is also able to say, I don't know for out of distribution inputs. In principle, maximum likelihood training of generative models encourages it to concentrate all the mass on the training data, which would achieve the global optimum of the objective. And intuitively, given the high but limited capacity of the deep generative models, we could expect that when trained, these models would assign high likelihood to in-distribution data and low likelihood to anomalous data, thus allowing us to detect OD inputs with likelihood. Unfortunately, it turns out that standard DGMs typically fail to detect OD data, even in seemingly very simple scenarios. So let's discuss this issue in detail. In the papers from Naliznik, Choi, and others, it was shown that generative models often assign similar or even higher likelihoods to output distribution data sets compared to the data that they were trained on. For example, the figure on the slide shows the distribution of likelihoods for different data sets of a real MVP normalizing flow trained on fashion MNIST. The likelihood for out of distribution MNIST data set is on average higher than the likelihood of fashion MNIST. It is important to know that MNIST and Fashion MNIST are very different semantically. MNIST consists of handwritten digits and Fashion MNIST consists of images of clothes. An important question is why does it happen? Well, there is a few reasons for it actually. The first is based on the notion of typicality. The failure of generative models to detect OD data is especially surprising given the fact that they can produce samples semantically similar to the trained data. Referring to the graph from the previous slide, the normalizing flow can produce high fidelity images of clothing and none of the samples look like MNIST digits. This seeming paradox can be partially resolved by considering the difference between high density and typical sets of a probability distribution. For example, consider a normal distribution in d dimensions where d is very high. All the samples from this Gaussian will concentrate on a thin spherical shell at the distance of about square root of d from the origin. At the same time, the highest density point, the origin, would never appear in the samples. Similarly, the images that attain high density for a normalizing flow or another DGM will not necessarily appear among the samples. In our recent paper appearing at NURBS 2020, we put together another perspective on why normalizing flow models assign high likelihood to out of distribution data. As I already mentioned, maximum likelihood training of generative models encourages the model to concentrate all mass on the training data. However, it is not the case in practice for normalizing flows, and they have a fairly similar likelihood distribution on train and test. And for solutions which are not global optimum, there will be many solutions that have the same train likelihood, but generalize differently outside the train. In this figure, we schematically show two models which are trained on the Celeb A dataset of celebrity faces and the train data points are shown with crosses. The yellow model assigns high likelihood to semantically similar data, for example, face images that are corrupted with noise and low likelihood to semantically different images such as animals or numbers. This model would be well suited for OD detection. Whereas the red distribution assigns high likelihood to all structured images, which is the behavior we observe in practice for normalizing flows. 
In the paper, we show that it is the specific inductive biases of the flow model, defined by the invertible flow architecture, which determine the likelihood assignment outside of train samples, and consequently the OD detection performance. Thus, to summarize, if we train DGMs on images, we cannot trust their likelihood to be a reliable score for anomaly detection. Now, let's move to the examples of recent methods that successfully overcome the issues that we discussed and provide strong results in OED detection using generative modeling. A simple idea based on the discrepancy between the typical and high-density sets that we discussed is to use a two-sided typicality test. In this test, instead of only classifying low-density data as anomalous, we reject the batches of data which have either too low average likelihood or too high average likelihood. This would correspond to rejecting batches which don't belong to a typical set of the distribution in the information theoretical sense. In particular, this test would work fairly well in the amnest versus fashion amnest example that we saw, as well as for other cases when anomalous data has much larger likelihood compared to trade. However, this approach has several limitations. First, it works best if the data arrives in batches of points, which are all either in distribution or out of distribution. As the batch size goes to one, the performance of the method degrades significantly. Next, in some cases, the distribution of the likelihoods of the in-distribution and OD data are so similar that the method cannot distinguish them even with large mini-batches. For example, it wouldn't work for normalizing flows trained on CIFAR and with Celeb A as OD data. There is a generalization of the test from the previous slide, which is called density of states estimation. A high-level idea is that we want to not only take likelihood of the data into account, but also other statistics of the approximated distribution, and then check whether these statistics deviate significantly on trained data and test input. For example, for a VAE model, these statistics could be lower bound on likelihood, the cell divergence between posterior and prior in the latent space, and some other latent space statistics, for a normalizing flow, they can be latent variable log likelihood and determinant of the Jacobian. Using these multiple statistics makes the test more robust and allows us to do single point anomaly detection as opposed to group anomaly detection in the typicality test. We fit a kernel density estimator, for example, with an RBF kernel to the train statistics and then use these density as a scoring function for anomaly detection. In another recent work called likelihood ratios for out of distribution detection, it was found that background information, such as the amount of black pixels in amnest images, has a dominating contribution in the likelihood predicted by autoregressive models. The authors make an assumption that the likelihood of the data point X can be factorized into the background part likelihood and the semantic part likelihood. And when performing OD detection, we would only be interested in the semantic component. To achieve this, they propose to train a separate generative model, which is denoted on the slide by P background of X, that tries to capture the density of just the background. This model is trained on highly noised train data, in which semantic component would be corrupted and not affect the model's likelihood. Then the approach to detect anomalous data would be to use the ratio of the densities of the original model trained on a regular dataset and this background model. If we assume that both models captured background statistics equally well, then this ratio will be approximately the ratio of the semantic parts, and this score should represent the semantic likelihood of the input. The likelihood ratio test works significantly better than the standard likelihood for detecting OD data. Another promising approach is to train generative models on compressed representations, or embeddings, instead of the original images. A large neural network pre-trained on a supervised task on a large-scale image dataset can serve as a feature extractor, providing features that capture the semantic content of the inputs better than the raw pixel values. 
We found that normalizing flows typically perform better for anomaly detection, even with regular one-sided likelihood tests when trained on such embeddings. On this graph, we show log likelihood histograms for real NVP flow trained on different datasets, on raw pixel data on the left and embeddings extracted for the same image datasets on the right. These embeddings were extracted using a deep network trained on ImageNet. On raw pixels, the flow assigns the highest likelihood to SVHN dataset, regardless of its training dataset. SVHN dataset has the simplest structure compared to Celeb A and CIFAR, and is thus assigned with higher likelihood due to inductive biases of flows. On image embeddings, flow always assign higher likelihood to in-distribution data. When trained on features capturing the semantic content of the input, flows can detect OD data. So far, we have talked about approaches which can work in a completely unsupervised regime, so with no label information given. The following works have used similar ideas based on image embeddings to detect OD data in a supervised setting. Let's assume that we have a neural network classifier which is trained on a classification task and then during test time we want to detect whether an input is OOD. We can fit a generative model to the hidden layer activations of that deep neural network on the trained data and then use the model to detect OOD inputs with likelihood. This approach was initially considered with a simple class conditional Gaussian model and called Mahalanovic distance approach, but was also extended to class conditional normalizing flows. The flow achieved stronger empirical results, which is not surprising, as it is a more flexible model. Finally, we can simultaneously and jointly train the embeddings and the generative model on these embeddings. In this framework called Open Hybrid, the encoder maps the input into the latent representations, which are used both for performing classification of the trained data and to feed a normalizing flow. During test time, if the flow assigns low likelihood to an input, we detect it as anomaly. This method is currently one of the state-of-the-art approaches in supervised OOD detection. To sum up, the likelihood of deep generative models cannot be used as an out-of-the-box solution for anomaly detection, due to a number of challenges that arise with modeling the distribution of images. However, recently multiple strong methods have been proposed. The trend is that many successful methods often try to explicitly bias the generative model to assign likelihood based on high-level semantic features. And the future of generative models for OOD detection looks promising. This is the end of the talk and thank you.